Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Hello, and welcome to Word Pictures. I'm going to read from Revelation 19. After this, I heard what sounded like a roar, a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belongs to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has uh, avenged on her blood of his servants. And again they shout hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. For the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Okay, Ken, what do you say about that? <laughs> well, what about that? Does it sound like um, something's coming to conclusion here? Um, people in heaven rejoicing, there must be something going on. And look at those, I hope you have your Bible handy and you can look at it. Uh, these verses seem to be des describing even a resolution of something. What was the problem if there was a resolution? One possibility is that Babylon has been slaughtering God's people. We'll read about that in a moment. For how long has this been going on and for how long will it go on? Why isn't God doing something? Why isn't God intervening and remedying the situation? If God is loving and all-powerful, then how do we explain the fact that the world is not a nice place and God isn't fixing it? I mean, aren't those questions, oh, they're philosophical kinds of questions, aren't they? Well, we know if we've read Revelation in the past and done some comparing, that Revelation 19 is answering back to Revelation 4, 5, and 6. So look at these verses in Revelation 6, 9, and 10. Do they sound vaguely familiar to what we just heard? Then the Lord broke open the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witnessing. They shouted in a loud voice, Almighty God, holy and true, how long will it be until you judge the people on earth and punish them for killing us? That sounds very much like what we just read, read, read from Revelation 19, doesn't it? So your version said avenge, and I looked at a lot of different versions. Most of them say avenge. Uh, mine says punish. Um, that raises some questions. What is God doing here? Uh, does God end up the great controversy in which he's sort of stood back most of the time and, and let things sort of play out? He hasn't used force. He hasn't used violence, uh, except very rarely when it was really, really necessary. Is he going to end up the great controversy by doing something violent? What, what's going on here? Well, if God never changes, then perhaps this language is... And is the idea of a one God still pretty much the, the way that the thinking is back at that time, which is 2,000 years ago? It, never, it hadn't changed much for the 2,000 years or more prior to that, right? The, the, oh, yeah. Everything oh. ultimately goes back to God. Yeah. Okay? So when God lets, it looks to me like what is happening here is the tables are kind of being turned uh -huh. on this, on this uh, whore and, and the, these uh, kings. Yeah. So it's it just letting things work itself out. From us, our standpoint, it may not look comfortable, mm -hmm. but... Okay, so I, uh, with a little bit of Greek background, I thought I should look back, and I discovered that the word translated avenged or punished is ektikeo, 
Now, if you know a little bit about Greek, you know the word for righteousness is dikaiosune. The word for doing what's right is dikaio. Ekdikaio means coming out of righteousness. So what this is really saying is God's going to do what's right. Now, at the end, with the, is the right thing for God to do to, to come in with violence and just say, I've had it, I'm, I'm up to my ears in this, I'm, I'm sick and tired of it, <coughs> let me destroy everybody? That doesn't sound like God, does it? So it sounds like what we ought to be translating this verse is something like vindicate or maybe um, even act justly, act righteously, do what's right. So what do we mean when we say vindicate or do what's right? What, what, what are the implications of that? Well, maybe heaven has been puzzled because God has been keeping evil alive. Mm -hmm. and, and this is when God steps back and says, I'm no longer going to support and keep Satan breathing and keep the harlot breathing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it just seems like if God is doing something that's right, all of heaven is wondering why God is putting up with sinners. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then when it's run its course, it more or less proves that what he did was the right way to go, I think. Isn't that what vindication is? Yeah, well, that would seem. Yeah. The, through demonstration. Yeah. yeah. That's everything in God. If, if, you, if we get the idea, get away from the idea that God is a penalty payer and get the idea that God is a, like a parent, a parent has a duty to teach his kids. And we're all God's kids. Every, th every intelligent creature he created is his kid. Mm -hmm. And he has to educate them. And it takes time. Mm -hmm. And there's some tough learning. However, a lifespan is relatively short compared to eternity. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a small investment. So did, did God do anything here? Well, that's the question. What does God do to vindicate his name? If God were to step in right now and say, I want to clarify things, in, in, in the world here, everybody else in the universe has already got it. I want to clarify things here in the world. What would he need to do? Clarify. Hmm. Let, him say, let Satan run his course for quite a while till he finally mm -hmm. destroys himself. It. Exactly. Exactly. Is, is there a parallel with what we're talking about here in Daniel 12:1? Yes. You know that. So we haven't. You want to read that? Go ahead and read. Okay. Daniel 12, 1, um, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as it never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book, okay. and so on and so forth. So remember that, you know, we often think of being judgment, God's judgment happening, and usually judgment, we're so used to crimes being taken to court and mis misdemeanors and that kind of stuff. But remember, all of us are in God's co judgment this time. The righteous are going to be judged righteous and the wicked are going to be judged wicked. So for the righteous, this is a time of vindication, right? And that, w that should be obvious because look at the last verse of Revelation 18, just before the verses that Gary read for us. The last verse would be Revelation 18:24. Babylon was punished because the blood of prophets and of God's people was found in the city. Yes, the blood of all those who had been killed on earth. Is it fair for God to respond to Babylon killing all his prophets and all his people? Now, how, is, how does God respond? You know, what happens in this world is right looks like it's losing all the time and evil seems to prosper. Is this a time when when right is actually going to come out? Truth is going to show that it is uh, the right way? Well, we certainly hope that evil is not going to win in the end. <laughs> There's pretty good evidence of that, assuming that the Bible is telling us the truth, and we certainly believe that. But maybe this is where the tables are turning. Mm -hmm. Well, what we, this uh, first part of Revelation uh, 19 is not too much different than uh, Revelation seven, the latter part of Revelation 17. Exactly. We're going to come uh, to we're, that. We're going to keep saying this over and over again. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, it'll sink into us. Yeah. Uh, but that's... Uh, well, let, let me just 
take a couple of verses back in the Gospel of John. Now, we believe the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation are written by the same person. And what does he say about the judgment? Well, look at John chapter 3. This is right after that famous verse in John 3, 16, starting with verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. But all those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that they, the light may show that what they did was an obedience to God. So what's happening? God is basically just shining a light. And what do the evil people do? They run and hide. Revelation 6 says that. Is what do the good people do? Say, this is marvelous. Now we have light. Is this saying that we are our own judges mm -hmm. by how we act? We, we determine for God if we're true or if we're not? Mm -hmm. I mean... So now let's, let's, let's look at the question here a little more carefully. Certainly the people who are suffering torture and, and, and martyrdom even, to them, the question, how long, is a very important one. But in the great controversy, a much, two much more important questions are how and why. And God has waited 2,000 years already. He's going to wait until the how and why questions are clearly answered. He's not going to rush anything. So between these passages in Revelation 4, 5, and 6 and Revelation 19 now, we ought to be starting, at least, to get the answers. So how long does it take? Well, now, what is your how question, and what is your why question? Okay. The, in a, in the, a the, full the, sentence. Right, okay. The how question is, how is God going to bring it to an end? What does he need to do to, to bring things to a close? That's the how question. The why question is, okay, if he, and, and this is a really tough one for people who don't have our Adventist view, if God is going to somehow bring it to an end, as they believe by some kind of forceful action, why has he waited so long? I mean, why didn't, I mean, if you're really going to take that approach, he should have dealt with Satan when he first started thinking evil back in heaven. Prevent this whole mess. So that's the why question. Why has he waited so long? And we're going to see there's, a, there's an appendix to the why question coming up. It's even tougher. God doesn't want the, anyone to <clears throat> choose in favor of him under, under duress or a, being extorted to do so. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's well, we are not the only ones involved. There's That's the rest right. of the cosmos looking on. Yeah. Okay, so we have a prostitute or a, um, a city that's burning. Okay. And um, it's burning. People are happy about it for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, they, they looked in the city and there's blood of the prophets and the saints in the city. And uh, because of that, they're happy about it. Okay, well, See, it hold sounds on. like. Hold on. It sounds well, like. Let, let, let's get the full picture here. This city represents what? The, always a woman, a prostitute, a whore, whatever, whatever kind of woman. she's on fire. So right. she's on fire and the smoke's coming up. Okay, but yeah, let's, let's, let's back up a second. Mm -hmm. What kind of person is this? It's not just any city. What are we talking about? Well, We're right. talking about an apostate church here. We're talking about a church, see, or a church, a group of people that are, have, have had gazillion opportunities to do things God's way, and they've gone the other way as fast as they can go. It's Exceptionally, we're talking about somebody who was not faithful. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's what a horror is. Yes. They're not faithful, or they pull somebody faithful away from yeah. what they're okay. supposed to be doing and becoming yeah. a whore. Okay, okay so... So uh, this person seems to be getting her due. Yeah. Somehow. And it wasn't that she only had one chance. No. This, it wasn't say, well, or this, okay, now your time is up. I and mean, this has been going on to, to fi ultimately demonstrated that the, that's the way they're committed. So this was a church that was not faithful to God mm -hmm. or a church that pulled people away from God. And we shouldn't make the mistake of saying, okay, it has a certain name. We're talking 
church here, we're talking about a wide range of Christian groups. Um, and, and it could be a piece of each church. Exactly. A piece inside each exactly. church. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Now, another interesting thing here, especially in chapter, I mean, in verse 3 and 4 of, of Revelation 19, especially, I guess, verse 4, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down to worship God. Mm. Who are those people? Well, there was just a big series on 3ABN on the 24 elders, and uh, it was concluded that they are the representatives from the other worlds. Um, okay. Well, there's well, only 24 other worlds? <laughs> Maybe I didn't watch the last episode, but that okay. was... Well, the... Ben? There are two groups of 12. And I think they talk about, uh, some people say it's 12 the disciples in the Old Test Testament, but some people say it's some other group. The four beasts are the cherubim, I believe, mm -hmm. described in Revelation 4. So who used to be one of those cherubim? Satan. Satan. One yeah. of the four? Yeah. I have a question. At least, maybe, maybe the leader of the four. There's the covering cherub. You yeah. Up there. Yes. I thought I have a question. You said uh, we got in the Babylon the church. You say all on Christian church. Mm -hmm. What about all the other ones? Well, probably so. It's it's a little harder to 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 fit them in with yeah. the pictures we see here. But yeah, it's they very likely it well. includes includes other religious groups as well. Yeah. Uh, they, well, okay. I yeah. think they have to be judged. They're going to be judged yeah. too. Looking back at Revelation 4, it's interesting. In a circle around the throne were 24 other thrones on which were seated 24 elders dressed in white and wearing crowns of gold. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lighted torches were burning, which are the seven spirits of God. And also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass and so forth. So there's the same, same people. Uh, what back is in, in, the sea of glass? Well, it's a sea that looks like glass anyway. I think it kind of tells you the peace around the throne. Yeah. Oh, the peace where man. you know you get you get lakes that are so calm that they turn into glass. Yeah. And then you get the storm choppy ones, and that's oh. that's kind of indicated in Revelation too. You know. So around God's throne is peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that this twenty-four and four are mentioned back there in chapter four. They're mentioned here in 19. They're only mentioned one other place in the whole book of Revelation. That's an introductory scene kind of in Revelation 11. So why, why, if these people are so important, why don't we hear about them for that whole distance in between? Where are they? What have they been doing? What do you mean? Um, the, the scenes don't go to them anymore, does it? Who? The scenes, the, the different uh, well, visions. Well, I'm saying that here we, we, we have them named back in Revelation 4. The, the four angels Four creatures and, and the 24, 24 elders. elders. Okay. And here we have them mentioned, all of a sudden they're mentioned again here in Revelation 19. And they, suddenly they seem to be in the middle of the picture. And they're mentioned just briefly, very briefly in Revelation 11. And the question is, if they have been there all the time, presumably they have been, why, why haven't we heard about them? Well, aren't they observers in heaven? And we're yeah. the theater here on earth. Yeah. So really, um, they would just be watching, wouldn't they, to see what was going on? Mm -hmm. Now, we have often suggested that the most important part of Revelation, by far, is Revelation 12 to 14. Mm -hmm. And there's some justification for that. But there's also some justification by, by, for suggesting that one of the most important chapters in Revelation is Revelation 5. And because... What happens in Revelation 5? Do you remember? Five. Refresh our memory. This is talking about the scene of the scrolls, the seals and the scroll. And only one individual is found who's capable of opening the scroll. And who was that? A lamb. And what do we know about the lamb in that particular setting? Do you remember? It looked like it was crucified. It was crucified. Not Yeah. Exactly. Crucified, destroyed violently. Yeah, exactly. This is not, the word that's used there is very clearly not someone who sacrificed, is, is a sacrifice, but someone who's killed violently. So, um, and he opened, he opened the seals, mm -hmm. and the seals didn't 
you know, things happened as he opened them yeah. that weren't too, not all of them were very nice. Exactly. And But he opened them and, and all those things happened. Mm -hmm. And he was worthy to open them mm -hmm. for some reason. And it might be because he had gone through all this stuff before. Well, if you remember what happened back then in Revelation 4 and 5, they were, they were desperate. They couldn't find anybody who was qualified to open these, these seals. And then the one angel said, hold it, wait. We found somebody who's qualified. It's the slaughtered lamb. What about a slaughtered lamb makes him qualified when nobody else is qualified? Why do you suppose he's qualified? I was talking about Christ. Yeah. Sure. Well, there was, I kind of think of these generals that like to eat, with, eat their, what their armies eat and everything, you know, mm -hmm. never have any real... Um, you know, um, uh, privileges or yeah. anything, but they made sure that they they felt what their army was feeling. Yeah. But in a way, this is kind of like that. Only, only this lamb is worse than what the army feels like. Okay. Now, if we're going, to, there's there's a picture I would like to create here. It looks like there's an audience right around God's throne. They are probably the first ones that hear about everything that God does. They're right there, right? When God gives orders or whatever, they must be listening. They, they hear everything that God does. They're the primary audience. Wouldn't they have been the first ones to hear about God's plan for our salvation? Probably. Presumably. Absolutely. Wouldn't they be the ones who had the best knowledge of the whole thing from beginning to end, the whole great controversy? Don't you think they were attuned to everything that has happened and they watched not only everything God has done to win the great controversy, they watched everything the devil has done to try to beat God, right? They would be fully aware of all that, right? And maybe they were confused at first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible. And now they're singing hallelujah, we finally understand. So when Jesus came and lived and died his life, what does he do? He answers the questions in the great controversy which Satan has, 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 has raised. And those people standing around the throne, do you think they got the message? Well, Satan said God was selfish. Mm -hmm. And a slaughtered lamb is not selfish. No. Certainly not. And we could, we could go on. There's lots of things that the life and death of Jesus taught us that Satan didn't want us to know. So... If we're going to make those people the primary audience, that means we are not the primary audience. We, sometimes it takes us as humans, well now it's taken us 2,000 years and we still haven't got the message from Christ's life and death. Otherwise we wouldn't be here, would we? Well, we're even getting worse because now we're the star on our own Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. I mean, it's hard for us to understand that we're not the center of attention. Well. What I think that means is that someday we're going to understand why it is Philippians 2 and Great Controversy, page 666. God is going to show that panorama at the end. He's going to give the, all the details, at least in a panoramic form, right down through the history of the Great Controversy. And at the end, what's going to happen? Everybody, including Satan himself, is going to bow down and say, God... You did, you did everything you could possibly do to win as many people as possible. Isn't that the message we need to get? And you did that? it the right way. You did it the right way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though we may not be the primary uh, focus, but don't we agree that uh, people are a very important part of it? Because oh, yeah. all this, because God so loved the world mm -hmm. and he gave us an unmerited unmer gift of uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so. Well, if God was willing to come and die for mm -hmm. us primarily, it seems, at least the demonstration at least was done here. Yes. That ought to say something about the fact that we're pretty important, right? Yes. So, we, we, yeah, we need to, we, let's, not, let's not give. In fact, let me read you a verse. Look at Ephesians 3, 9 and 10 to, 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 to get an idea of the, the importance of human beings. And of making, this starts in the middle of a sentence, and maybe. Let me start it just at the end part of verse 8. News about the infinite riches, sorry, hold on. My, 
news about the infinite riches of the, of the good news about the infinite riches um, of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept the secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. What's it telling us? God is teaching through the church. First Corinthians 4, 9, we can go and read that one as well. We are the theater of the universe. This is where the great controversy is playing itself out. For better or for worse, this is where it's happening, right? So, in light of all this, is it easier to understand um, about why the, the, the story of Revelation moves back and forth? Because they're up there look, taking the big picture and they see, oh, here's what Satan did, there's what God does, here's what Satan does. And the story goes like that through the book of Revelation. Uh, RSV, verse 10 of uh, Ephesians 3 that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Yeah. I mean, who else has that message mm -hmm. outside of the, the Seventh-day Adventists? Yeah. And, and it's, it's a minority among Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. Well, do the other churches read that verse in the Bible? Oh, they'll say they do, but they don't know what, they probably didn't put it at the edge of the plate with the bones. They don't know what to do with them. <laughs> they don't know who the principalities of the heaven is? <laughs> probably not. Well, I mean, they, I'm sure they, they read it just superficially. I know some people, but they still, that, that recognize this, we're, we're in a spiritual battle with, with, uh, with uh, principalities and powers, but they still have the idea that someday God's going to come down and he's going to reap vengeance. And, you know, they're great, really nice people, but they've got this one thing that somehow God's going to do it. No, how about God stepping back and letting it run its course, mm -hmm. which is a, so well, we know that God's going to do the right thing. Yeah. There we That's go. That's what it's saying. Yes. But do we know what he's going to do? Th that well, we can call it the right thing? We're, 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 keep reading. God isn't dead. Next no, up. no. You know, I always picture like uh, when you watch the ants on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. God is, we're like little ants to God. Okay. Is it going to be give God satisfaction to get out a whip and whip out the, whip those little ants? I mean, we are so insignificant. There is no way that God can get satisfaction from whipping us. But look at one thing that they would focus on in these verses in, in verse 3. Again, they shouted, praise God, the smoke from the flames that consume the great city goes up forever and ever. And they would say, what's happening? The wicked are burning and they're being tortured and so forth. And aren't you glad you aren't one of those wicked people? No, it's not the fires that keep going up. It's what that keeps, keeps going up? The smoke. It's the smoke. What's the smoke? What is smoke? That shows that there was a fire. There was a fire, right? It's what's left over from the fire, right? Where there's smoke, there's over. fire. There was fire. <laughs> there well, was fire? There, there's, yeah. Fire has smoke too, but, but this doesn't... It never. This well, doesn't, well, it doesn't come back. This it doesn't mention going. the fire. Doesn't. It just mentions okay. the smoke. It's about time for us to take a break. Oh. But the point here is this, you see... What happened, happened. And the results will, will last forever. That's what it means when it talks about the smoke going up forever and ever. So now we're going to get ready to move on to Revelation 19.5. That's pretty self-explanatory, really, I think. And then we're going to go to 6-8, and that's where we're going to be when we come back. So don't go away. There's some very significant stuff there, too.
Welcome back. We're so glad that you decided to stay by. We're ready to move on now into Revelation 19, 6 to 8. Let's just take a look at those verses. Then I heard what sounded like a large crowd. Now we had a rejoicing back in the first few verses. Here they are again. Like the sound of a roaring waterfall, like loud peals of thunder. I heard them say, Praise God, for the Lord our Almighty King is God is King. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us praise His greatness, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb, and His bride has prepared herself for it. She has been given clean, shining linen to wear. The linen is the good deeds of God's people. Now I think this follows on immediately with what we just read about the smoke ascending up forever and ever. I need to ask one more question about that. Do you think a God of love would be praised if he was torturing people forever and ever? Would that be a reason to shout hallelujah, I'm so glad these people are burning? And then the onlooking universe, First Corinthians 4 and 9, they've been looking at this for thousands of years. They lived with the mess in heaven mm -hmm. before the, four a third of them were cast out to this earth or swept out with the devil. Uh, and then right at the end, now they're going to be praising hallelujah over... Well, it's like when a dictator comes into a country, the people are praising hallelujah so they don't get shot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, so... Okay, so um, what's going on here now? All of a sudden, in the middle of this several chapters that talk a lot about conflict and war and people killing and all that kind of stuff, suddenly there was a wedding scene. What is a wedding scene doing here? Well, you know, the last hallelujah was from the beings in heaven, the 24 elders mm -hmm. and stuff. This uh, hallelujah seems to come from great multitudes, uh, many waters. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, people from many waters is the people from earth. So this yeah. seems to be the group from earth now that's shouting Now hallelujah. there's another, ver another group shouting hallelujah. And who are they? Look at verse 9. Then the angel said to me, write this, happy are those who have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the angel added, these are the true words of God. Question. Yeah. Uh, we're getting ready for a wedding. What happened to the whore, to uh, the church, that now? Well, the whore apparently has been consumed and gone. Okay. The smoke is going up. But some, some religion believed that the whore was, it's coming down from heaven. The, oh, yes, they do. They believe uh, the whore uh, was uh, raptured. Uh -huh. Because they didn't mention it for so many for uh, so long, and they really I wish we'd talk about that for those who don't know. Well, if if she was raptured, you know, usually the people who are raptured are supposed to be the good people. Uh, whores aren't usually considered to be good people. <laughs> I have a big problem with that, um, and we, we read here we read in, in verses three and four that she's going to burn. Why would that? Uh, why, why, would, why would that be the case? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, Jesus is the bridegroom, uh -huh. and they're getting ready for a wedding. Uh -huh. Okay, so where is the uh -huh. bride? Well, the bride, it very clearly says the bride is God's people. Yeah. Now, it goes on to say that. We haven't got to that yet, but yeah. At least her clothes are made of, of the works of the God's people. Yeah. 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 So... I mean, certainly it's not a whore wearing the clothes of God's, the good, good deeds of God's people. It doesn't well, make any sense. If anything, it would be the other, it would have been the, the woman that stood on the moon in the first place. Yeah. If she was bright, yeah. uh, we didn't, it didn't explain why she was bright, but this, this person here getting married, she's got bright linen on. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the good works of, of yeah, people. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> look what comes next. Revelation 19.10. I fell down at his feet to worship him. This is John. He's just received this wonderful message from the angel. Welcome to the wedding feast of the Lamb, right? He, I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do it. I am a servant together with you and with your fellow believers. All those who hold to the truth that Jesus revealed worship God. Which is a reasonable thing to say, right? And my version then says, for the truth that Jesus revealed is what inspires the prophets. The truth which Je that Jesus revealed is what inspires the prophets. Now, 
those of you who have been Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists for much of your life know that the King James says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit, spirit of prophecy. prophecy. What does that mean? He is the core of the prophecy. Traditionally, we have, we have translated it and, and understood it in this, this way. Back in Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12, it talks about the faithful people being those who keep God's commandments. And in Revelation 12, 17, they have the testimony of Jesus. Well, so what's the testimony of Jesus? We go over to Revelation 19, 10. It says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we are the people who keep God's commandments and we have the spirit of prophecy, and that, of course, would be the writings of Ellen White. So we're home free. We're guaranteed a trip to heaven, right? No. Well, isn't the spirit of prophecy also the writings of um, uh, the other prophets, Moses, mm -hmm. uh, Nehemiah? What, a, what is prophecy? Okay, well, let's talk about that. Uh, the, well, let's look at t testimony first. What is testimony? It, the interesting thing is that the Greek word translated testimony in that passage is marturia, from which we get martyr. Okay? It's, a, it's virtually a personal testimony of Jesus. This is also attractive, attractive explanation of his name. This is, this is a, from a, a scholarly journal. This is also an attractive explanation of his name, logos to thou, or the word of God, in Revelation 19, 13, which is coming up. Its eschatological pericope, a pericope is a passage, as not only the watershed of the book, but also the, fundam, the fulfillment of many of the allusions in Jesus' addresses to the churches. So what does all that mean? Well, here's another a bit more of an explanation from... Are, a, are you saying that the spirit of prophecy is Jesus' life? What, what we're suggesting here is the testimony of Jesus. We haven't got the, to the spirit of prophecy yet. Me, the testimony of Jesus yeah. is his life. I was wrong on that. The, his, testimony, yeah. of Jesus. the testimony of Jesus, what th we're suggesting here is that the testimony of Jesus is what we should have learned from his life and his death. That's his witness. His testimony was what he was trying to teach us when he came here and lived and died here on this earth. That was to teach us about the Father. Yeah. So that was his testimony. Okay. Yeah. So the expression to have the witness leads to Revelation where it, it, where it occurs more than once in a number of places, 6, 6 verse 9, 12 verse 17, 19 verse 10. But the most striking feature in Revelation is the phrase, hey martyria Jesu or Jesu Christu, which is found in six of the nine occurrences, Revelation 1, 2, verse 9, 12, 17, 19, 10, twice, and then in 20 verse 4. The genitive, now this is a Greek construction, but let me just bear with me for a moment, is a subjective genitive. This means that Jesus himself is testifying. So what kind of message is, are, are God's true people at the end giving? The message that Jesus gave. Yeah. The message that Jesus gave. They are telling the truth about the life and death of Jesus. That's the message. Only twice is there reference to human witnesses. That was the Revelation 11, 17, 11, 7 and 12, 11. In many cases, the Logos Tutau or Entolai Tutau are closely related to Martyria, Yesu, so that we have a twofold expression. In other words, the Word of God, back in the Gospel of John and here in Revelation, is the same as the testimony of God. So we call, who do we call the Word as a person? Jesus. Jesus. The Word of God, what does that mean? What do we usually, if I say I pick up the Word of God, what, do you, what am I picking up? We're talking about the Bible. We're talking about the Bible. So all of Scripture is the testimony about Jesus. The, from, he, is the, he is the God of the Old Testament. He is the God of the New Testament. Yeah. Martyr, that could also be witness. Yeah. Okay, a witness. And Jesus had lived with his father. Jesus learned when he came as, as a baby. He learned from his father. He learned from studying the prophets. And so he gave a witness. Mm -hmm. And he was teaching us. And, and when he did his teaching, he used this portion of the Bible, what we call the Old Testament. That was his Bible. So that was his message. So the great controversy we are suggesting is coming here to a head. The people living in the final days 
have to be a group of people, not just a single individual as important as Ellen White is, a whole group of people who are telling the truth about God as represented by, especially by the life and death of Jesus Christ when he was here on this earth. That's what we're suggesting. So now we turn to Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse, its rider called Faithful and True. It is with justice that he judges and fights his battles. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and he wore many crowns on his head. He had a name written on him, but no one except himself knows what it is. The robe he wore was covered with blood. His name is the Word of God. And there we come to the testimony of Jesus as the same as the Word of God. The armies of heaven followed him, riding on white horses and dressed in clean white linen. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which he will defeat the nations. He will rule over them with a rod of iron, and he will trample out the wine and the winepress to the fierce anger of the Almighty God. On his robe and on his thigh were, was written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, that's the next section. What are we supposed to learn there? Well, first of all, notice once again that just as back in Revelation 4, now here in Revelation 19, it talks about an open heaven. And we really tried to emphasize the idea that the difference between God's side and Satan's side is that God is completely open. He's transparent. He doesn't have anything to hide. He's willing to tell the truth. Satan has to keep hiding because he doesn't want us to know that he's lying to us, right? So now in this description of Jesus, there's, there, I mean, this talk about Jesus, there are three things we need to talk about. There's a description of what it looks like. There's something about his name, and there's the task that he does. And we're going to focus on one particular thing that's a little bit confusing, a robe dipped in blood. So the fiery flames in his eyes, that came from Revelation 1.14. It's an expression of which we get from the book of Daniel, Daniel 7 and Daniel 10, verses 6. The many crowns on his head, we know what that means, right? Um... We talk about his actions. We he talk about a sharp, sharp sword. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later. What about that blood on his robe? Is that his blood or the blood of his enemies? Yeah. And of course, what we're really talking about is, does he win by massively exercising his force and destroying his enemies, or does he win by shedding his own blood? Well, if it's dipped in blood... Um it seems like it might be his own blood. If it was okay. splattered, it would be his enemies as he slayed them. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? That, <coughs> isn't it the martyrs? The blood of the martyrs? One of them says sprinkled. Well, there were, w the, the blood, it talks about the blood of the martyrs back in chapter 5. Right. But we're, we're trying to figure out what's going on here. Because uh, also back in chapter 5 is blood from the slaughtered lamb. Right. What is a robe dipped in blood? Well, what is a robe dipped in blood? Do we have any examples from the Old Testament? Well, if you look at, the, if you look at places like Isaiah 63, won't take time to read it right now, verses 1 to 3, it talks about God trampling out his enemies, people coming from Edom and splattering their blood all over the place, and some of that blood gets splattered on his robe. But now it's splattered blood, it's not dipped blood. So is that, is that important? Um, Joseph, the brother of the yeah, of, the son of what Jacob. What did they do with his robe? They dipped it in blood, it made yeah. it look like he was dead. Well, look at look at some other places. In, there are there are a couple of passages from the Apocrypha. What do we know about the Apocrypha? No, it wasn't put on the same level as what we consider the Bible. But back in its yeah. day, it was held in some esteem. Yeah, and it was written primarily in that period of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this represents the thinking of people in those days. And in the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18, verses 15 and 16, Thine all-powerful word leaped from heaven down to the royal, from the royal throne, a stern warrior into the midst of the doomed land, bearing as a sharp sword thine unfeigned commandment, and standing filled all things with death. In other words, What's this, what's this person who's leaped down from heaven do? He's killing everybody around him. And while it touched the heaven, it trod upon the earth. And there's some other places. Um, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the days of Jesus, there were people who tried to translate the Bible from 
the Hebrew that most of them couldn't read to the Aramaic, which was the typical language of the, the Jews in Jesus' day. And here's one of those translations. He, the king, king Messiah, girds his loins and goes out to battle against those who hate him. He kills kings and rulers and re reddens the mountains with the, from the blood of the slain and whitens his cloak with the fat of their mighty ones. His garments are rolling in blood. Well, and then Jim mentioned Genesis 37, 31 to 33. Look at that. Then they killed a goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. There's it dipping in the blood. They took the blood robe to their father and said, We found this. Does it belong to your son? He realized, he recognized it and said, Yes, it is his. Some wild animal has killed him. My son Joseph has been torn to pieces. Is that talking about uh, violence? Is it talking about, was Joseph, did his father think his, his Joseph was a victim or a victor? A victim. A victim, yeah. Okay. Christ was a victor, and that's one of the important differences. But most, most he was he, he became a victor by being a victim, didn't, yeah. didn't he? Right, but he came in through the back doors against a general, would do all the killing right up front yeah. in the face. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the difference, here's, here's someone who wrote all about this section of Revelation. In the difference between Yahweh's garments being sprinkled with blood and dipped in blood lies all the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Of course, we would say there's not that much difference between the old and the new. The difference between the conception of God judging his enemies by shedding their blood and the conception of his judging them by shedding his blood for them. Right. Is that a possibility? I think so. Another expert from England writing about this said, almost certainly it is his own blood, that of the slaughtered lamb. This then is the vision of the Christ who conquers not by killing his enemies, but by allowing himself to be killed, and who invites his followers to do the same. I mean, what could be more counterintuitive than the idea that you conquer by being slain? And what could be more counterintuitive to the Israelites than a Messiah that they believe was supposed to come help them conquer the Romans, and being that, that Messiah being killed by the Romans? Okay. It's kind of hard to understand how that works, though. Yeah. I mean, you can say that this is all backwards, which it is, but why? Why does it even work? Well, and that's the question. See, it works because of the way God's kingdom works. See, if God's kingdom worked by, okay, let me show you who's got the biggest arm here, God could just wipe people out and say, yeah, we see, God can do that. Yeah. But he, he chooses not to do that. So how does he do it? He wins by revealing the truth. What did he reveal when, by dying that way? He revealed... Sin leads to death. That was one of the main messages. He proved that he was, he was the, the Messiah. He proves that he was God because he rose in his own power on Sunday morning. And there's a whole bunch of other things he revealed. So God wins not by beating up on his enemies. He wins by revealing the truth. I have a question. Yeah. When we get to heaven, will the Bible be there and we can sit down with Jesus ourselves and say, would you explain this passage? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, so we may be doing Bible study in heaven also? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, notice some other passages that might support this idea. Revelation 14, 4 says, these people who follow the Lamb, they follow him wherever he goes. And where did he go? He went to self-sacrifice and martyrdom. No, we're not very nice places to go, right? So Revelation doesn't offering, offer just absolutely convincing, undeniable arguments for things. It says, Revelation 2, verse 7, and lots of other places, if you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So we've thrown out a couple of options here. What do you think? Does God win by exerting His almighty power and wiping people out and maybe even burning some forever? Or does he win by revealing the truth? And he did that, of course, by dying. Have we? But what is the truth, though, by dying? He's trying to convince you something that humans have an incredibly difficult time of believing, and that's that sin leads to death. We think that somehow or other we can go on sinning, God will forgive us, and there won't be any consequences. Well, why does that convince you? Just because he died on the cross? Well, why did he die? He died in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
and an angel had to revive him. He went out and did it all over again. Haven't we learned anything? Well, that's, that's for somebody who listens and looks. I mean, even the disciples fall asleep and couldn't even see Exactly. It. Well, um, how's that revealing anything if nobody is watching? Well, I mean, but some people were watching, and Paul got the message. John got the message. We have their writings to read. Should, we should have gotten, we should be getting the message 2,000 years later, shouldn't we? Surely should. I mean, we have all of Ellen White's books to, to learn from. Should we be getting the message that Eve was lied to mm -hmm. and that God really tells the truth? And yeah. so that should be the message that we should believe what God says because this whole thing has proven that God told Eve the truth. Yeah. When you sin, you will die. Uh, uh, yes, go sorry. ahead. I have a question. Are we... You know, we long ago God was a vengeful God, and we had God killing, and it was. Now, are we going too far to the other side? Because I believe God can does kill people. At the well, end, He said He will. I believe God can do those things if He wishes to. Well, we have plenty of examples in the in the Bible. See, but now we're talking about things at the end. Will God violently kill the wicked in the end? That's the question we're trying to deal with. That's the, the the issue here, because in the Bible it says that he he will and he does. In the next chapter, We're not talking about the wicked at the end, there's no oh, places you can read okay, about that. Okay, okay. There are there are places in the Bible where he deal he does that with people. The flood, the firstborn in Egypt, down to the yeah, there are places, and you know this this is not a you uh, know a, a you know an unanswerable argument. Um, there are places where it suggests, you know, mm -hmm. that there's, there's two sides of this. Um, I want to talk about one more thing before we run out of time here. Uh, I'll leave that one for you to think about. What about Revelation 22? For we talked about a name that nobody knows. Revelation what? what? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to compare this with Revelation 22 verse 4. And one commentator said this is the most wonderful verse in the whole Bible. They will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. Is that going to be a glorious day? Yes. I think so. Doesn't but that mean it, a lot of tattoo companies are going to have a well, field day Well, let's think about this for a moment. <laughs> if his name is unknown, how could it be written on our foreheads? That didn't make any sense, would it? Would it yeah, does you it? You've got to know the name before it's written yeah. on the forehead. And Jesus, when he was here on this earth, John 17, verses 4 and 6, I have finished the work you gave me to do. I have made you known to those you gave me out of the world. I made your name known. This is a finished revelation when he was here on this earth, right? What's so good about verse 4, they will see his face. No one can see God's face unless they're pure and holy. Mm -hmm. So this means these people have made it to heaven. Yes. And they are cleansed. Yes. And then they can see God's face. Mm -hmm. And then God's face is reflecting in their, in their faces, yep. on their foreheads. Only a correct and complete revelation can make God's name known. The name that no one knows is in the perspective of the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, a name that people think they know only to be confounded by the revealed reality. They, people think God is a monster. People think God is going to wreak havoc on the world. People think God is going to be torturing the wicked forever and eternally burning flames, etc. Do they know God? No, they don't. And that's no. why they don't know his name is because they don't know all facets of his personality. Well, this unknown name is a what we might say a pre-revelatory name. That is, they don't understand the truth about God yet, but the saved will understand it when they're saved. Right? They'll know the truth about God. Is this a different name? Now, it says Revelation 19.13 the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Now, yeah. Is that what you're getting to in 22 over here, or is there two different names? No, that's one of the names. There, 
because in some place it says the name is an unknown name, but then it calls him the Word of God, and now over in 22 it says they'll see his face and his name will be written on the forehead. Another reason that heavenly beings can't understand God as completely as humans is because they are not sinful creatures. Mm -hmm. And humans have seen God uh, <laughs> um, work with sin and bring them out of like being tarred and feathered in this sinful world. Okay, well there's one more thing I want to talk about here in Revelation 19. I know we're rushing through here because we're trying to get the chapter finished. That's Revelation 19 verses 17 to 18. Uh, look at that. What in the world is going on there? Now we've just talked about an invitation to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Look at this. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun. He shouted in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come and gather together for God's great feast. God's great feast. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and soldiers, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all people, slave and free, great and small. What kind of, what kind of invitation is that? Well, the vision's got to be like a battlefield where there's mm -hmm. dead bodies all over the yeah. place. There's probably blackbirds, seagulls, and everything all just going like on a dump. Yeah. Uh, on on this battlefield with all these bodies here, and that's the image that's that's kind of which was, being portrayed here. Which used to happen back in those yeah. biblical yeah. times. So yeah. God is not a respecter of person; it's just everybody, irrespective of well, their title. What's what we're talking about here is this is the end of, and it's going to go on to say in a few of our verses. This is the end of the enemies. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the who's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. The beast and the false prophet, right? So God's enemies are going to perish. And the incredible thing, which we're going to talk about next time, is why not the devil? Why isn't he involved in this? How, do, how come he survives? Hmm. That doesn't make any yeah. sense, does it? He's the, he's the greatest villain of all, right? I think he's going to get it later on. You think he's going to get it later on? Well, we'll see. Uh, and this this battle is this is this the, we're talking about the results of the battle of Armageddon? Is that what we're talking about here? The feast that the birds said? And we're, we're running out of time here. But I would like to suggest to you that the greatest battle of all is this final one, and the the war is going to be won, and God's going to win it. See you next week.